everyone, welcome back to another Magical Girl video. Today I'm going to be talking about everything Powerpuff related, but only one of these series is a traditional Magical Girl show with transformations, an animal sidekick, and magical weapons. The others fall into that category of technically they're Magical Girls in the superhero kind of way, but not all superheroes are Magical Girls, so it's more about your personal preference. Debate amongst yourselves in the comments, I just wanted an excuse to talk about my lifelong obsession. The Powerpuff Girls, created by legend Craig McCracken, is a college short film turned series of shorts turned Cartoon Network original that became a massive hit, turned anime turned back into a less popular cartoon, to almost horrible live action series akin to Riverdale, and back again to a cartoon coming out whenever. We've got a lot to cover today. So let's dive into the long legacy of the Powerpuff Girls. Once again, the day is saved! Thanks to the Powerpuff Girls! Back in 1992, Craig McCracken made an animated short called oh, Wabaster. Despite the vulgar name and overall simplicity compared to what will come, Wabastu has a lot of elements that would be included in the first Powerpuff series. Staples like the sugar, spice, and everything nice. Plus, crazy ingredient intro. The Amoeba Boys, the Gang Green Gang, the pink blue green colors of our lead girls, and the Day You Save slogan that ends every episode are all present, albeit in rough forms. In the short, we get a fun introduction and a fight where the girls murder the Amoeba Boys with the heat of the sun. Mr. McCracken also made some more unfinished whoop ass material. But this college short is what convinced Cartoon Network to give this idea a shot. After a name change, of course. We recorded the first short with Whoop Ass. It went through fine. And Mike Lazo, uh, the creative head of Cartoon Network, was at this uh, cable buyers conference. He said, yeah, we're making this new short called the Whoop Ass Girls. And someone, some cable buyer or somebody stopped and said, what? Uh, there were tons of different names. Yeah. It was hard getting past Whoop Ass for him for a long time. Yeah. I couldn't for the life of me come up with another name. We came up with every iteration that we could and just nothing was fitting and I was like, just none of these things felt right. And separately, two friends of mine, Paul Rudish and C. Cam, had actually come up with Powerpuff on their own. I was like, oh, that's, that's not bad. That's pretty good. I like that. So I kind of sat on it for a few days and I thought it was interesting they both came up with it. And so then I just went, Okay, that's gonna be it. It's gonna be Powerpuff. Gonna I be think I should've kept it. it as Whoop-Ass Girls. In 1995, What a Cartoon, an anthology series that went through a couple of name changes throughout its run, began airing on Cartoon Network as a showcase for ideas that could become shows. It was the starting point for many Cartoon Network classics like Courage, Johnny Bravo, The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, Kids Next Door, and Dexter's Lab, just to name a few. Of course I bring this up because this is also where Powerpuff debuted. In February of 1995, the world officially met Blossom, Bubbles, Buttercup, and Fuzzy Lumpkins. Not Mojo Jojo? Alright. In the short, the girls have to stop Fuzzy Lumpkins from turning Townsville into a butcher shop with his meat gun. What? I'm sorry, this is what we're starting with? So ridiculous, but not a bad story. The following short dropped in January of 1996 and is called Crime 101. It's about the Amoeba Boys being useless villains. I love that this has been an idea since the very beginning. I think both shorts are really fun and give viewers a taste of what this world can be. And luckily, Cartoon Network was impressed as well, and the Powerpuff Girls became a full series. Finally, after years of hard work, The Powerpuff Girls is officially on the air as a standalone show and it's so fun! For this part of the video, I'm going to highlight the first and last episodes of each season, plus the ones that stood out to me for good or bad reasons. I did watch every episode for this video, but if I'm sitting here telling you the plot of every episode, you might as well just watch the show. I don't want to be redundant here. Okay? Okay! The first episode is an exciting tale called Monkey See, Doggy Do. Haha, <laughs> fun. It's our official introduction to Blossom Bubbles Buttercup, the Professor, the Mayor, Miss Bellum, and the iconic Mojo Jojo. 
So in this episode, Mojo Jojo has stolen this ancient dog head and uses its powers to turn everyone in Townsville into dogs, including the Powerpuff Girls. However, even in dog form, the girls kick his monkey butt and turn everyone back to normal. It's a simple episode, but an effective one that allows us to understand who these characters are. Bubbles cute, Blossom smart, Buttercup feisty, Mojo evil anime inspired villain, you get the idea. The sister episode is called Mommy Fearest. This one not only introduces us to one of the few female villains, Sedusa, but it also gives us a look at the girl's dynamic with the professor. Professor Utonium is an absolute gem of a father. He's not perfect, he makes mistakes throughout the series, but he loves his daughters and loves parenthood. That being said, as a single dad, he begins to worry the girls don't have any positive female influences. He thinks the girls need a mom. Insert Sedusa in disguise. She charms the professor, and in doing so, uses her power over him to stop the girl's heroics. Obviously, the girls figure out who she is, expose her lies, and have her arrested, but I really like that the show addresses the single parent insecurities right at the start of the series. Out of context, hearing that a grown man made little girls in his basement is kinda creepy. But the professor is just a loving man who wanted to be a father and accidentally made superhero children. He's a kind, mostly responsible father to Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup, and he wants to get this fatherhood thing right. If you did not have a dad that cared as much as Professor Utonium, you deserved it. Can't relate though, my dad's cool. The next episode I want to talk about is Buttercrush. This one's still pretty early in the season, but it stuck out to me for two reasons. One, Buttercup focused episode. I feel like out of the three she gets the least love, but I will defend her. I might be a Bubbles girl, but Buttercup is such a mood. Second, stay with me here. Grooming! Again, you'll have to hear me out on this. In the episode, Buttercup develops a crush on Ace, leader of the gang Green Gang, a prominent group of villains throughout the series. This is kept one-sided, nothing inappropriate happens between the two, but Ace, who is 17, so not a legal adult, but still too old for Buttercup, who is in kindergarten, <coughs> acknowledges Buttercup's infatuation and exploits her for his own personal gain. Grooming has a few definitions, including the action of attempting to form a relationship with a child or young person with the intention of inducing them to commit an illegal act. Buttercup herself isn't committing crimes, but she allows the gang Green Gang to get away with destroying public property, and she almost gets her sisters killed. Luckily, Buttercup realizes that Ace isn't the guy she thought he was, saves the day, and apologizes to her sisters. I think this is actually a great episode to teach kids to be careful who they admire or have a crush on. As someone who was groomed at a young age, it's not an experience I'd wish on anyone. That being said, I appreciate this episode for attempting to show what grooming behavior might look like to a young audience. It's subtle enough not to be offensive, but apparent enough to get the idea across. With this being the official first season, the Powerpuff crew has made sure that we get to know each of the girls individually. In Pace Makes Waste, Buttercup finds herself in a sticky situation after harshly teasing a young boy named Elmer. Because... Glue... Get it? Her ego gets in the way of her apologizing, which is a relatable flaw to many, but when Elmer becomes a paste monster, she has to find the courage to apologize so he won't terrorize Townsville. Why did he pull Blossom and Bubbles out of his nipples? As a kid, I didn't appreciate Buttercup as much as I do now. She's headstrong and has a good heart, but she's young and still learning when she should approach situations in a softer way, which is difficult for the toughest fighter. I love this struggle setup. Blossom is the leader. She's smart, resourceful, and also has an ego, but in a different way from Buttercup. Blossom can have a bit of a superiority complex that can sometimes be to the detriment of her sisters. A good example of this is in the episode Ice Sore, where Blossom discovers that she's the only one with ice powers. The professor explains that each of the girls will have unique abilities that are discovered as they age, like Bubbles speaking Spanish. <laughs> Blossom is told not to use her powers, but after her peers beg for her to cool them down, she starts to enjoy her new power a bit too much. It's great when your abilities can help others, but you're not better than another person because of them. That being said, Bubbles and Buttercup are also in the wrong here for being so jealous of their sister. Although I understand why they'd be upset. 
Sibling rivalry will never die! Lastly, my favorite Powerpuff, Bubbles, is the sweetest of the group. She loves animals and all things cute. But because of her sweet demeanor, everyone underestimates her fighting power. In the iconic episode Bubble Vicious, Bubbles has to prove that her cuteness does not make her weak. You can kick butt and be adorable! I can't believe you defeated Mojo all by yourself! You really whooped him! And look! She took the laser all the way to 11! Whoa! Man, Bubbles, we really underestimated you! And you know what? What? You're hardcore! Really? I like that the show immediately establishes individual struggles for the girls. As a unit, they're already interesting, but having them stand out as their own characters is perfect. They're similar enough to be believable sisters and crime-fighting partners, but different enough to where they won't agree on everything. Am I making sense? I just love them so much. Anyway, Season 1 also introduces us to one of the most iconic villains in the series. The Rowdy Rough Boys. What, did you think I was talking about somebody else? Mojo Jojo decides to create his own perfectly evil children after being defeated by the Powerpuff Girls one too many times. In his attempt, he creates Brick, Boomer, and Butch. Some of those names have aged better than others. Of course, being stereotypical little boys, they're disgusting and can't be taken down by the usual roughhousing, so the girls get some helpful advice from the smartest character in the show, Miss Bellum. Have I talked about Miss Bellum? Because I adore her. She's the mayor's beautifully intelligent assistant and is the only reason anything gets done around Townsville. The mayor is a goofy baby man. How did he get elected? Is Townsville in the United States? Because that makes so much sense. Back to Miss Bellum. She tells the girls to... Try being nice. Huh? You know, nice. I get it? Ew, gross. This results in the girls hurting their masculinity with affection. This hurts them so much that we don't see them again until season 5. Great episode. Minus some points for shipping. Can we not? They look like siblings. Season 1 ends with the episode Uh Oh Dynamo. The professor worries about his daughter's safety after witnessing one of their battles firsthand. This inspires him to create a giant robot named Dynamo that can aid them in battle. The girls don't use it for the longest time until they find themselves facing a foe they cannot beat. From there we get an epic robot monster battle inspired by works from Japan. It's really cool. But what isn't cool is the amount of property damage done. Yeah, didn't think about that one, did you, Professor? But, but, uh, Professor! Well, um, uh, gotta go! This is one of many episodes that have the professor, professor feels, feels the need to be an overprotective parent, parent despite, despite the fact that his children have superpowers. superpowers. Plotline. It gets repeated a handful of times throughout the series, but it's a decent conflict. What caring parent doesn't worry about their kid? Even if they have superpowers, they're his little girls still learning about the world. Can they really handle any evil that comes their way? I have a little surprise for you! You're getting a nose job? You're getting married? You're getting fired? No, not that kind of surprise. Season 2's opening episode titled Stuck Up Up and Away introduces a new villain who will become a series regular. Her name is Princess and she's a stuck up rich girl who can't accept the fact that she will never be a Powerpuff Girl. Sorry, but you can't. We're superheroes. We were born with superpowers. You can't just buy superpowers. Oh yeah. Tell that to Batman! Well, she has a point! Ooh. Honestly, if Princess was actually nice, she might have been able to help the girls. But alas, she is the product of emotionally neglectful parents. Princess's mother doesn't seem to be in the picture, and her father just hands her money when he doesn't want to deal with her. Which is all the time. It's actually really sad if you stop to think about it. But you know what isn't sad? The Powerpuff Girls' explosive popularity! No one could predict how much merchandise would be produced and sold throughout the show's run. These girls were slapped on everything. Plushies, notebooks, clothes, accessories, video games. If you can think it, executives half power puffed it. Maybe if we were lucky, we'd get maybe like a few t-shirts in a couple of record stores or some hip stores. I mean, that's all. 
I really thought could possibly happen. With it. And the next thing you knew, it, it, it blew up. This was so much of a shock to the crew that the episode Collector was made. The antagonist of this episode, Lenny Baxter, is the embodiment of what bronies were thought to be back in the day. He collects everything possible related to his Powerpuff obsession, desperately needs to hit the gym, and needs a shower. Please take a shower! Anyway, this greaseball of a man has collected every piece of Powerpuff merch in existence, but he craves more. So what does he do? Collect the Powerpuff Girls and seal them away forever! That was the plan, at least. But as a twist, the citizens of Townsville save the girls! The episode even acknowledges this at the end, and I really love that. After everything the girls have done for Townsville, it's about time they were repaid. Are they even getting paid? Is there a Powerpuff tax? Speaking of repayment, the next two episodes focus on that. First, Birthday Bashed is about the girls trying to celebrate their birthday, but all of the notable villains thus far have sent them gifts from prison, which are traps meant to destroy them. These girls cannot catch a break. What's interesting about this episode to me is that their birthday is being broadcast on television, meaning they're viewed as celebrities, at least in Townsville. There's a season 3 episode that makes me think they're only local celebrities, but we'll get to that one later. Anyway, you could say that the Powerpuff Girls are child stars. Their circumstances are different, of course, but it makes me wonder how this attention could affect them as they grow up. The following episode actually explores their burnout. As far as I know, these girls are not being paid for their work, and still have their regular kid responsibilities. School, homework, chores, etc. Add the responsibility of having to save Townsville every day, and you can imagine how stressful their lives are. They might have superpowers, but they're kindergartners. They're little girls who are having to handle a lot more than they should. The town has grown lazy, depending on these unpaid girls, and they've had enough! Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup decide to take the day off, and let Townsville figure out their problems themselves. This results in one of my favorite scenes in the show. Why shouldn't you put a toaster in a bathtub full of water? Because your toast would get soggy. I'm surrounded by idiots. I thought you were surrounded by gumdrops and ice cream. If the girls are already fed up with the adults around them at five years old, I can only imagine how it'll be when they're older. I really wish we had a teenage, young adult version of the Powerpuff Girls that explored the challenges of having to save the world from a young age. These girls are overworked and not paid. Give them free college at least. Free therapy. Okay, I've talked enough about the girls being overworked. Next, let's talk about an episode that highlights their childhood innocence. Rainy Day Adventure is honestly one of the best episodes in the series. It's a simple story. The girls are stuck inside on a boring rainy day, and try to pass the time by playing make-believe. The professor even gets involved, and it ends up being a fun day for everyone. So much so that the girls don't want to stop playing when the sky's clear. I wanted them to keep playing too! This episode captures the energy of childhood play so well. The ideas, the bickering, the parental involvement. It felt like I was not only watching a fun episode of the girls enjoying their childhood, but I also felt like I was transported back to mine. Amazing episode. 10 out of 10. One of the most iconic episodes to come out of this season is Twisted Sister. The girls want some help with their crime-fighting duties so they can enjoy their regular lives more. So they try to create another Powerpuff Girl, albeit in a messier way than the professor. As hilarious as this is, once again I have to acknowledge that these girls are so overworked that they feel the need to create more help. In comes Bunny, a very sweet but not-so-normal Powerpuff who has to learn the ins and outs of crime fighting. She doesn't quite understand how the whole superhero thing is supposed to work, and the girls have to help Bunny identify who is good and bad. By the time she figures it out and helps the girls in battle, she dies. Yeah! I have never forgotten this episode. It's one of the few that has stuck with me for most of my life. I was so upset the first time I watched Twisted Sister. Rest in peace, Bunny. You're a legend. Uh, uh, oh, it's so sad, I can't take it. So, for the first and final time, the day is saved. Thanks to Powerpuff Bunny! Whoa, whoa, whoa! 
<laughs> Him is by far the scariest villain. He is a scary, drag queen looking Satan, and he's iconic. Has somebody done him as a drag look? Can this be a drag look? One of his more unsettling appearances is in the episode Speed Demon. After school, the girls run so fast on their way home that they travel to the future. A dystopian future where Townsville has become a wasteland, no longer protected by the Powerpuff Girls. Who has taken over Townsville since the girls left for 50 years? Him. Now it's up to the girls to reset the timeline. The imagery in this episode is absolutely terrifying. Miss Kane waving as she stares off into the distance, mumbling to herself, is so unsettling. The professor, Miss Bellum, and all of Townsville look awful. And the girls are blamed for it. You did this. No! All I did was take over. It was easy. Why'd you leave us, Powerpuff Girls? Why? You weren't here to protect us. You weren't here. It's your fault. Your fault. Your fault. Your fault. Your fault. Your fault. What? This whole episode is unsettling. And it once again brings me back to the point that the girls will need psychological help when they're older. Sorry to keep bringing it up, but I am so concerned for these girls. Even if the episode did end happily, these girls are having nightmares forever. Heading in a completely different direction, the last episode of season 2 is slumbering with the enemy. The girls are having a sleepover and Mojo Jojo disguises himself as a girl to infiltrate the party. Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup know it's him from the start, but decide to have some fun as he seemed to be harmless. They all have a fun night, but eventually Mojo strikes, and it's up to the normal girls at the party to take him down. Again, I love when the day is saved part of the episode is altered to fit these unique narratives, where the Powerpuff Girls have to be saved. It brings me joy, and it feels like the Powerpuff team was having a lot of fun with their episode ideas. Slumbering with the enemy is such a fun episode to end with, the montage with the girls and Mojo is such a treat. TV time! Yay! Yeah, TV! TV! Favorite show! Come on! Yeah, TV! TV! Favorite show! Come on! Alright! Please, if it will make you shut up, watch TV. Yay! Season 3 begins with a unique episode titled Fallen Arches. It isn't about the Powerpuff Girls or any of the main cast. Instead, it's about two former heroes who have to work together again after many years apart to defeat a trio of old foes called the Ministry of Pain. The girls, of course, can't fight these guys because they're old. Respect your elders, they say. So they attempt to get Captain Righteous and his sidekick Lefty to fight them. Only problem is, they don't like each other. It's a really fun setup and the payoff is even funnier. This was a great way to start the season. And I wish it stayed this fun, because Season 3 has a handful of episodes that are placed almost back-to-back -back that are so mean-spirited. Right after Fallen Arches, we get the main event, where Blossom's perfect hair is ruined by her sisters and she spends the entire episode being made fun of, even by her own father. However, this episode spins this tragedy into something positive, with Blossom learning to laugh at herself. And, and that, that there's, there's nothing, nothing better, better than, than revenge. revenge. This episode is the least mean, but it gets worse. In the episode Bubble Vision, not to be confused with Bubble Vicious, Bubbles has to get glasses, and the episode is spent making fun of her bug eyes. And when she does finally learn not to be ashamed of them, she gets her sight corrected. Boo! Pointless, mean, but still not the worst. Town and Out is one of the worst episodes in this season, and is one of my least favorite Powerpuff episodes ever. The girls move out of Townsville, which already doesn't make sense, and move to the cleverly named Citiesville. The entire episode is just people being mean to the girls and everyone being miserable. I get that it's supposed to be, what, what if, if the, the girls, girls were in a traditional, traditional superhero, superhero setting like, like Gotham? Gotham? But when I see stuff like this... You realize the two crooks that you caught stole approximately $400. 
Do you realize that you did over three million dollars in property damage to that bridge? It's not replaceable! It fills me with dread. Like, that physical feeling of anxiety and uncomfortableness. I did not enjoy this episode, and I did not enjoy the professor not being open about his feelings when you can clearly see that the girls aren't happy either. I hate this episode. Let's move on. The last mean-spirited episode is actually kind of funny. Child-fearing is just... Mojo Jojo torture. The girls need a babysitter, the mayor doesn't want to do it, and Mojo gets hired for the job. He doesn't even get the chance to do anything evil. The girls just keep kicking him down. Like, like let, let the, the man, man breathe, breathe my, my lord. lord. By the end, you feel sorry for the poor guy. It's mean, but it's so funny. Some other episodes worth highlighting are Monkey See Doggy 2, where Mojo retries his plan from the very first episode, and it still fails. Power Prof, where the professor once again tries to aid his girls in battle, this time by creating a super suit, and ends up being too overprotective. And Super Zeros, an episode that has some wonderfully creative visuals. The girls try to imitate their favorite superheroes, and have to learn that in order to be great heroes, they have to be themselves. Although Bubbles hopping on a pogo stick in a bunny outfit brings me so much joy. She's precious! One of my favorite episodes in Season 3 is Equal Fights, an episode that teaches viewers what true feminism is. Villain Femme Fatale convinces the girls to hate all men, and that she should be able to commit whatever crime she wants, in this case stealing every Susan B. Anthony dollar, to rebel against this misogynistic society. Femme Fatale is quite convincing, and the girls start being mean to all the men in their lives. It's not until Miss Bellum and Miss Keen step in that the girls learn about misandry and the true meaning of equality. The girls teach this lesson to Femme Fatale as well, giving us a great, truly feminist moment. Susan B. Anthony coins, huh? Do you even know who she was? She was, uh, uh... Once upon a time, women weren't allowed to do much of anything. Susan B. Anthony knew that that was wrong. In 1872, she broke the law by voting, and even though she was found guilty, the feds wanted to go easy on her. Because she was a girl! Susan B. Anthony didn't want special treatment. She wanted to be treated equally. She demanded that she be sent to jail just like any man who broke the law. Feminism is not about hating men or being better than them. It's about having true equality. Not being turned away from opportunities because of gender. Not being catered to or punished because of gender alone. What we're born with or identify as should not define our opportunities to chase our dreams, make a living, or pursue education. That's true equality. And I'm so glad this episode was made. I think now more than ever we need to know the definition of feminism and the history of why it's important. The last Season 3 episode I want to talk about is Meet the Beatles. Get it? Like Beatles? Music? Haha. <laughs> anyway, this is a fun team-up featuring Mojo Jojo, Princess, Fuzzy Lumpkins, and him. They commit crimes as a group, Mojo becomes infatuated with Moko Jono, this is a play on Yoko Ono, isn't it? Ooh. I just got that. And then the group falls apart. I'll admit, the Beatles references are lost on me. But this episode is still very enjoyable because it's fun to see some of the most iconic Powerpuff villains work together. It's a great way to end the season. And Professor Dick is good, right? And he's only interested in good and goodness. Good, 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 good. What? Season 4 is a standout season, not just because of the episode quality, but episode length. Almost all episodes in this season are single segments. The Powerpuff Girls has done this before, but usually one episode contains two segments. It's a nice change that doesn't hurt the stories being told. Usually when there's a format change, there's a risk of the episodes not being as good, but that's not the case here. Season 4 opens with the episode Him Diddle Riddle where the girls have to solve him's timed riddles in order to save the professor from paying. Vague. As the story progresses, the riddles get more and more chaotic. The girls are panicking, fearing for the professor's safety if they fail. But it turns out the professor would literally be paying. With money. 
at Him's Diner. Okay, I know Him is the most powerful villain who can twist reality into whatever he wants, but is this just a throwaway joke or do the villains in this show have day jobs? Obviously, Princess does not because she's a kid and rich, but what about the other villains? How does Mojo Jojo afford the supplies for his inventions? Does he have to pay rent for his volcano lair? Fuzzy Lumpkins has a house and nephews that stay with him. How does he afford to take care of them? Did he build that house? Are those kids getting an education? Did Fuzzy get an education? Or the Amoeba Boys? What job would they be good at? Does Sedusa have OnlyFans? I'm kidding, of course. And none of the villains can be working if they're in prison. But they obviously don't stay there long if they keep coming back to commit crimes. So how do they afford food, housing, utilities, and supplies for their plans? I guess stealing? They are villains, so that checks out. I guess. Where was I going with this? Speaking of villains, the next episode features Mojo Jojo going back in time to stop the creation of the Powerpuff Girls. Kind of. So there's a career day at school and the professor brings in his latest invention. A time machine. He reflects on his past success, what initially inspired him to become a scientist, and his mission to create the Powerpuff Girls. Disguised as a fellow classmate, Mojo gets the professor to set the time machine to the day he was inspired to create the Powerpuff Girls. He jumps in, the girls go after him, and we get a wacky time travel adventure. First, I love that the past has more muted colors than the present. I think that's a nice touch. Second, Miss Keen and the professor are in the same class. They most likely grew up together, and I think that's neat. The ending of this episode is pretty cool. Mojo and the girls traveling back to the past was always supposed to happen, because the professor being rescued by the girls was his initial inspiration. He just didn't know that they were his girls until the end of the episode. This man was always meant to be a father, and I think that is so wholesome. I'm not a time travel fan, but between the creative visuals and the wholesome ending, I definitely recommend Get Back Jojo. Members Only is an interesting episode not just because of the feminist moral, but because it's a fact that other superheroes exist in this world. There was another episode early on about a superhero who turned out to be a fraud, but these guys are the real deal. We've got some crossover with Dexter's Lab, but there are also some original characters unique to this episode that reflect different parts of the world, from an early 2000s point of view. So the girls try to join the Association of World Supermen. The only problem is, they're girls. Despite winning all of these ridiculous challenges, my favorite being Bubbles' race. Um, excuse me, am I just supposed to keep up with you or is someone supposed to win? Oh, one of us should definitely win. Okay. The girls are told they can't join because they're not men. This comes back to bite the AWSM because of villain attacks and they need the help of the Powerpuff Girls. The episode even ends with all the guys asking to be Powerpuffs because they're so cool. Yeah, we were all wondering if, um, we could be in your club. You are our heroes. The Powerpuff Girls is feminist propaganda and I'm here for it. Shifting the tone, I want to talk about the episode that traumatized me the most as a kid. Knock it off. It's about the professor's college roommate. Prepare for this name. Dick? Hardly. Oh, oh my, my god. god. I just know the writers were having fun with this one. Paying a visit and trying to make his own Powerpuff Girls for profit. He names his products the Powerpuff Girls Extreme and ships them all over the world. But as his greed grows, the quality decreases. When the girls try to confront Dick about his unethical practices of creating life, he refuses to give up the Chemical X and swallows it. Any sort of morbid body transformation makes me so uncomfortable. When I saw this as a kid, I couldn't finish the episode. I switched off the TV the minute he started morphing into whatever this is. 
Is there a phobia for this? Because it still freaks me out. Anyway, Dick traps the girls and slowly takes the Chemical X out of their bodies, which will kill them. So it's up to the professor to save his children. When things look bleak, he tells them that he loves them so much, and the factory made Powerpuffs retaliate. You never gave us love. Where was our love? Dick made his Powerpuffs for profit. The professor made his out of love. That's why they turned out perfect. Having children, or in this case, making them, is something that should be done out of love, not through profit or any sort of selfish desire. They're human beings who deserve the opportunity to thrive as they grow, and to feel loved and secure. Dick could never provide that for his creations, but the professor always has. This is such a great episode demonstrating the harms of greed, and the importance of unconditional parental love. Next! The last episode I want to talk about is the season finale, Super Friends. A new girl named Robin moves next door, and immediately becomes friends with the trio. Why, hello there, Robin. It's very nice to have you as our new neighbor. I'm the professor. Yeah, he made us in his laboratory by accident. Well, what can I say? Don't worry, Professor. I was an accident, too. <laughs> Your dad is funny. Um, anyway, the girls have so much fun with their new friend, but soon their superhero responsibilities get in the way, leaving Robin all by herself. Enter Princess, who is there to spend time with Robin, but is anything but a good friend. She's either bragging about her dad's money, or is trash-talking the Powerpuffs. She sets Robin up so she can play superhero, but the girls immediately catch on to this, reaffirm their friendship with Robin, and the episode ends with the girls happily playing together, as the professor gets them out of having to work an unimportant job. Well, the girls are pretty busy right now. Maybe they could come by later. Season 4 is by far the shortest season, but that's for good reason. Cartoon Network had greenlit a theatrical Powerpuff Girls movie. So, we have Blossom, Bubbles, and... Buttercup, because... it also begins with a B. Hmm. Super Friends aired on May 18th, 2002, and the Powerpuff movie dropped just a couple months later on July 3rd. It's the first Cartoon Network Studios original theatrical film, and was the only one for a long time. From what I could find, regular show got a limited theatrical movie release, so I guess that counts. Teen Titans Go! also had a theatrical movie, but that's a DC and Warner collaboration. So not technically Cartoon Network Studios despite the Cartoon Network Association. Point is, this movie was a big step for Cartoon Network. Visually, this movie is lovely. It feels like an upgrade of the original, but not so much that it's too different. There's one scene in particular where the girls are in space, and the colors are muted except for their eyes, and it's eerily quiet. Oh my gosh, it's perfect! It captures the pain and the confusion these girls feel. I love it! The story, however, is not what I would have picked for this film. It's a superhero origin story detailing the events of the Powerpuff Girls' beginnings. Problem is, we already know their origin from the intro. It's not that complicated. I love this movie, and I watched this movie so much growing up, but between the predictable story and the world not being ready for female cartoon superheroes in 2002, I see why this movie didn't make a lot of money. If you take marketing into consideration, Cartoon Network and Warner Bros. probably lost money. I'm honestly not sure how this movie could have succeeded in this form at this time. Female-led superhero movies in the States still struggle over 20 years later. I don't think the world was ready for a Powerpuff movie, and having a story we already know the ending to doesn't help. I love the Powerpuff Girls movie as a fan, but I think the team needed to dream bigger with the plot. Have them go on a mission to save the universe or defeat some giant world-ending evil instead of... monkeys. Mm, monkey. Now, you get a time out to think about what you've done. When you realize your mistake, you can come back and we'll discuss a proper punishment. <laughs> Less talking, more thinking. After a box office flop, the girls came back to TV with a fifth season, beginning with the episode Keen on Keen, a simple story about the girls setting up the professor and Miss Keen on a date. It's uncomfortable at first, but when the two realize this was set up by Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup, 
They enjoy the night and accidentally fall in love. This leads to both of them neglecting their responsibilities, annoying everyone, and breaking up because the professor is not a cat person. Who's Valentino? Yeah, who's Valentino? My cat. Aw, a kitty. Meow. You have a cat? Yes. Don't you like cats? Well, uh, I had a really bad experience with a cat once. Well, it couldn't have been that bad. It made me jump off a building. Oh, that's ridiculous. I'm with Miss Keen on this one. Back when I used to watch cartoon reviewers as a kid, I remember the general sentiment was that the Powerpuff Girls' last two seasons were awful, and I'm happy to say that is not the case. Season 5 actually has a lot of great episodes. Power Noia is a thrilling hymn episode where the girls have to face their biggest fears and their dreams. Save Mojo is a hilarious episode where every time the girls try to stop Mojo from committing crimes, animal activists get in the way. Blossom does her best to explain that Mojo is not a defenseless animal, but a supervillain. And the episode is just Mojo saying, Oh, I'm being oppressed. And getting protected until the girls find a way to both punish and protect Mojo. There are actually a couple of episodes with moral values for some reason. Curses is an obvious swearing bad episode with a giant potty mouth monster to seal the deal. I love how the citizens of Townsville look at the professor when the girls say that they learned the word from him. No, that new one. Oh, you mean I learned that from you, professor. You're always teaching us new stuff. <laughs> oh, well, that can't be right. Uh, let's go over here and figure out where you really learned that word. Leave him alone. He's a single dad trying his best. Also, I hate how the adults around the girls don't explain why the word they're using is bad. Like, Miss Keene knows the girls and should know that they wouldn't say or do anything harmful on purpose. Well, two out of the three. So, this is what a timeout is like. Ah, uh, you get used to it. I know the story wouldn't progress if she did, but very out of character for her. Girls Gone Mild is another fun one. This time the girls are attacked by the PAPP, an activist group trying to prevent their children from witnessing the violence of the Powerpuff Girls. I wonder where the writers got that idea. The antagonists are perfectly annoying, the cops are frustratingly useless, and the episode ends with the girls finally getting to use their powers again once things get too out of hand. Honestly, if so many parents have a problem with the Powerpuff Girls, why don't they just move out of Townsville? The girls are local heroes. Just move somewhere else! You have the money! Season 5 has a lot of fun monster villain episodes as well. Monstra City explores the dynamic between monsters and people, as the monsters have to move into Townsville once the mayor turns their home into a factory. Huh? Uh, this does not last long, as the only thing these two groups can agree on is hating each other. But a later episode, Substitute Creature, implies that monsters still get work in Townsville, despite being a hated minority. I guess Fuzzy and Mojo live in Townsville too? But Mr. Green is such a genuinely good guy, and the girls keep being jerks to this poor man because of how he looks! Those cookies looked spectacular! Leave this man alone! We also get the return of the Rowdy Rough Boys. Him has resurrected the boys, and this time, girly kisses do not work on these gross little dudes. And I mean it when I say these guys are gross. The Powerpuff Girls is no stranger to gross out, but it's not super common. However, there is a scene where Brick pulls off a scab and- Oh my! I did not enjoy that! <laughs> the boys are still defeated by their masculinity being threatened, this time by being humiliated and talked down to like babies. I like this as it fits in with the original episode, but still feels different enough to justify their comeback. The episodes Boy Toys and Bubble Boy also feature these guys, and I don't hate them, but they're not as memorable as I once thought. The show has much better villains. Debatably, the most controversial episode to come out of this season is See Me, Feel Me, Know Me. It didn't air in the United States for years, and the only way to watch it for the longest time was in the 10th anniversary DVD box set, which didn't come out until January 2009. The reason the episode was banned was due to religious imagery and possibly some of the lighting effects. I think the religious argument isn't the strongest, but there are some things that could be considered Christian. Like this guy looking like some Jesus art, kind of. Or some building debris looking like crosses? Maybe? If that was the case, that was really dumb. The lighting effects, however, 
I could see a case being made for that if this episode didn't air in other countries. I won't show the intense scenes here for your sake and mine, but I personally had to look away during the scenes with flashing red lights. It hurt my head so much. I'm usually not sensitive to lights, but what's in this episode is too much. See Me, Feel Me, Know Me is a musical episode about the girls once again feeling overwhelmed by their superhero responsibilities. But this time, a magical Jack Black sounding gnome appears and offers world peace in exchange for their powers. Fun fact, Jack Black was contacted for this role but did not accept. So the role went to Jess Harnell. Wacko Warner, Jerry from Totally Spies, and Crash Bandicoot are just a few of his iconic characters. He does a fantastic job in this episode. The original Powerpuff Girls has good casting in general. Blossom, Bubbles, Buttercup, The Professor, Miss Keen, Mojo Jojo, him, the mayor, they all sound exactly as they should. No one feels out of place, everyone works well together, like the Powerpuff Girls themselves. These actors are part of a formula to create the perfect production. Back to the episode, the girls give up their powers and enjoy normal lives in the now peaceful, but cult-like city of Townsville. It's not until the professor sings his musical number about American freedom that the girls realize there cannot only be good. Good is always partnered with bad. Otherwise, neither would exist. The girls sing yet another song while beating the gnome and this moral to death. And yeah, this episode was alright, I guess. If it wasn't banned in the States for so many years, I don't think this episode would be as memorable as it is. I appreciate the attempt to make a rock opera style musical. I love musicals in general. But the songs here are at best catchy. They're not phenomenal. I do like how Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup harmonize. Their voices are meant to be together. They are perfect. However, some of the lyrics are a bit... dumb. In one of the last songs titled, You Wanna Make Us Feel Real Good, I don't. There's a lyric that goes, There's no dark without the light. There's no dim without the bright. There's no warm without the cold. There's no weak without the bold. There's no sun without the moon. There's no fork without the spoon. What? It rhymes, I get it. But forks and spoons? No, that's so dumb! The spoon predates both the knife and fork. There was a time without forks, but with spoons. Not only is this a stupid lyric, but it's inaccurate. God forbid I want accurate cutlery history in my cartoon about bug-eyed little girls made in a man's basement. So yeah, gnome go bye-bye. Girls are heroes again. Freedom. America. Yeehaw. Season 5 ends with the episodes Silent Treatment and Sweet and Sour. I loved Silent Treatment. It's about the girls fighting a silent movie villain and rescuing the professor. Any episode where the artists get to be creative is a win for me. The Powerpuff Girls look so good in this old-timey style. Sweet and Sour, on the other hand... Ugh. Basically, this group of cute animal criminals are allowed to get away with crime, because they're so adorable! And if the Powerpuffs do anything to stop them, they're ridiculed by the very people they've been saving for years! You'd, You'd think, think the, the public, public would trust their, their opinion by this point. point. So what did the girls do? Use the criminal's cuteness against them. Great ending, annoying episode, but not the most annoying. Shout out to Shut the Pup Up, because that episode was migraine inducing. And I wanted to say the title. The show has great episode titles. Despite covering the season finale, I need to backtrack a bit before getting to season 6. On December 24th, 2003, the Powerpuff Girls dropped a Christmas special called Twas the Fight Before Christmas. Princess, being a total brat, cannot accept that she's the entirety of the naughty list. So she switches the list so she can get her Powerpuff wish and everybody else gets coal. Knowing this isn't right, Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup make their way to the North Pole to tell Santa he's made a mistake. He doesn't believe them at first due to his exhaustion, but it eventually clicks with him that those are the Powerpuff Girls. And as he praises them, Princess exposes herself as a truly naughty child, which results in her being a permanent name on the naughty list. The girls then help deliver all the Christmas gifts to the good children all over the world, and everyone enjoys a happy holiday season. This is such a lovely special. 
Although I found Santa's design unsettling as a kid, this man needs a shower, a skincare routine, and a nap. I think it's funny though that this is one of the few episodes I remember watching on TV. It reran every Christmas for years, so it makes sense why I would. But when I make these videos, it's always fun to see what I do and don't remember. You can put the old ones in these. He wants to throw us away! What's he need two garbage cans for? We can all fit in one! It could get messy. Here, take the cans with you. I have to call Miss Bellum and ask her to bring a big knife. So you want me to throw them out just like that? And why don't I just eat them? Uh, be my guest. We've finally reached the last season of the original Powerpuff Girls. And it's not bad. The episode begins with a callback to the movie and the introduction of the character Mopey Popo. He wants to be evil, but just can't get it right. Prime Mates is my least favorite season opener, but it's not bad. I just don't find the sidekick with a funny voice messes up everything trope to be funny. Is that a trope? I feel like it should be at this point. Since this episode is not a great start, I'll go ahead and highlight the bad before the good. Wreaking havoc is disgusting. The professor adds Chemical X to chili and feeds the town. You can guess what bodily function that correlates with. That's Not My Baby isn't awful, but if you can't stand babies crying, do not watch this one. It's not something that bothers me a lot, and even I was annoyed. But the worst episode in the season, and maybe the entire series, is sunscreen. The girls are at the beach, don't wear sunscreen, get too close to the sun during battle, and are burned. Most of the episode focuses on the pain of this burn, with some uncomfortable close-up shots of the girls' stubby arms and legs. I usually don't like to call out writers, but Thurop Van Orman made this one. The same man who created Flapjack. This, this makes, makes a lot, lot more, more sense, sense now. now. Despite the gross out, the episode was definitely a great way to encourage kids to use sunscreen. And I think that's worth the discomfort. Knowing more kids were scared into protecting their skin. Including me. I'm afraid of the sun. Now for the good. Season 6 has some fun callbacks to Powerpuff lore, like Dynamo, and the more human-looking Powerpuff designs Craig McCracken made after a test screening went horribly. We get fun team-ups like the gang Green Gang and Sedusa, or Mojo and him co-parenting the Rowdy Rough Boys. I love the episode custody battle. It's just him and Mojo arguing over their parental rights and who is more evil. It's amazing. Of course, we have some great original episodes as well, like West in Pieces, a steampunk reimagining of the Powerpuff Girls with faded colors and a dusty atmosphere to match, Mo Linguish, where Mojo Jojo becomes an English teacher at Townsville Community College, and everyone picks up his speaking patterns. My favorite, though, is Little Misinterprets, where the girls think the professor wants to murder them and create new little girls. They try every way they can to convince them they're worth keeping, but when they can't, the girls switch up so fast and adopt the kill him before he kills me mentality and blow up his lab. These girls resort to property damage before asking questions every single time, I swear. This episode had me on the floor with how quickly the girls switch from sad to vengeful. They were not going to let that slide. I love these little menaces. The very last episode of season 6 is Octagon, which is the episode that features this sound that was popular on TikTok at one point. Where's Bubbles? She's probably upstairs combing her hair so she'll be the prettiest girl at the party! I'm gonna be the prettiest girl at the party! Octagon is a fun murder mystery story where Bubbles is trying to figure out who hurt her beloved Octi. Would her sisters really hurt her favorite toy? What about Miss Keen? The mayor? Mojo? Who could it be? The ending is actually very sweet. The professor accidentally ran over Octi with the vacuum and it didn't end well. So he took Octi back to his lab to fix him up, but Bubbles found the remaining evidence before the professor could finish. Oh, and Mojo gets food poisoning. The Powerpuff Girls literally ends with shit humor. Live, laugh, love it! What's neat about the last four episodes is that their production numbers are closer to season five instead of six. Production code numbers are a way for broadcasters or anyone searching to identify when an episode was made during a series production. The Powerpuff Girls doesn't get majorly out of order until the last three seasons. The one episode in season four that features two segments was made in season three and has the production code 313. 
while all the other episodes start with 4. Season 5 stays in order minus 2 gaps where 503 and 505 should be. Season 6 has those 2 missing Season 5 episodes, or 4 missing segments, added to the end of Season 6, and they both aired on March 25th, 2005. While the rest of Season 6 aired from April 16th, 2004, to August 27th, 2004. Why did Cartoon Network wait so long to air these episodes? My theory is that Cartoon Network really didn't want to let the show go. Craig McCracken was approached for a seventh season, but turned it down. At a certain point, Cartoon Network came to us and said, well, what about seven? What about a seventh season? And Chris and I both said, no, I think it's time. It's over with. It had its run, it kind of ran its course, and we would hate to continue making a show when we're just kind of hitting the same notes and repeating ourselves. And we want to kind of go out while it still was good. He was already focusing on Fosters for a while, and I respect that he didn't want the show to run itself into the ground. Season six, while not bad, is definitely the weakest of the bunch. I enjoyed a lot of these episodes, but it was definitely time for the series to say goodbye. For now. We'll be right back with the Powerpuff Girls. All of the episodes <laughs> in one pretty package. <laughs> Behold, your saviors! The complete Powerpuff Girls anniversary collector set. Six DVDs containing all of the episodes and a load of special features. All in one pretty package. In stores January 20th. Hi, welcome to the item segment. This is Candy. And she's not going to be much help. But I still love her. Oh, <laughs> I know it. It's not fair. Hi, welcome to the item segment. This is one of two because I don't have that much Powerpuff merch. Yay! But I do have some fun items. Let's start with my dress. So technically it's from the reboot series, but I thought it'd be fun to wear in this section because I'm not doing another item segment other than the anime, so... Why is there a truck passing? Anyway, yeah, look how cute and fluffy it is. It is from Hot Topic, and it has a lot of really cute design details. It plays on the aesthetic of the intro from the original series, I think, with the whole sugar, spice, and everything nice, plus Chemical X. I absolutely love the art on this dress. Like, look at the little octopus, and the bunny, the candy, the sugar, the hearts, the rainbows. There's just so much detail here that I absolutely adore. Now for the items! First I have this vintage Bubbles plush backpack from the year 2000. It has the original tag and it says Made in Indonesia, Cartoon Network, 2000. It's very cute, very soft. She looks a little goofy, but you know, who doesn't? Honestly, it's 2024, normalized goofy. There's not much space in the bag, honestly, plush backpacks do not hold that much. But you could probably hold like one of those card holders or lipstick. <laughs> I, I really don't know what else. Tiny things, tiny things for Bubble to hold in her head. Head will not be empty. Yeah! Alright, next is this Powerpuff cookie jar. I am collecting cute little things for when I move out into my own place because yes, I am a sad little person who still lives with her parents, okay? We don't have to talk about it. I'm in college! Anyway, this is for my future kitchen. Very cute. It just stays in this room right now just because I don't want to put it away. It's adorable. It's vintage. Again, this is from the original run. But I just love it. I love the heart, the flowers the girls. <laughs> it's fun. Out of this small collection, this is the only item that is actually from my childhood. This is the 10th anniversary box set, which I believe was released in 2009. It is a collection of six DVDs, and you can tell I very much used these. Look at the, this box, looks atrocious. Like, what is going on here? Oops. 
But yeah, it has all 78 episodes plus extras, holiday special, and this really cool arrangement of posters. Now the discs themselves are actually really cool because they are double-sided. I had never seen this before I got this set. So you can imagine this blew my kid mind. And on the back of the put it together poster is episode guides. So yeah, that's really all there is to this set. I think this was like the first time you could get the entire series together in just one package. So this is honestly really cool. And as you can see, seasons one and two are bubbles, seasons three and four are blossom, and seasons five and six are buttercup. I got this for Christmas one year and I was just so excited to have it. I love the Powerpuff Girls, obviously. So yeah, I love this. <laughs> I'm sure there's like updated releases of this that have like Blu-rays or just higher quality footage, but this is the OG. I love this. It's so cute and very, very special to me. And lastly for this section, I want to talk about the Game Boy Advance game, Him and Seek. There are a lot of video games based on the first Powerpuff series, but the one I have is Him and Seek. Published by BAM Entertainment and Vicarious Visions, and released for the Game Boy Advance on October 29th, 2002. The game has you play as all three girls as they go through Townsville on a scavenger hunt. However, the items are a little questionable because him tampered with the list. It's up to you to collect all of these wacky items by talking to the citizens of Townsville, stopping crime, fighting bad guys, and returning lost items. I'll be real with you guys, I got stuck at the him level for an embarrassing amount of time. Thank God for internet guides. But overall, the game is a lot of fun. You can easily beat it in an hour or two, and the game is filled with lots of callbacks to the show. Check it out if you're into 22-year-old games. Oh my god. And that is all for this segment. I hope you enjoyed. Look forward to the next one and the rest of this video. Bye! The Powerpuff Girls. Coming forward, we are official protectors of truth and justice. I'm Blossom, the Red Powerpuff Girl. My magical yo-yo will right wrongs, fight evil, and protect the citizens of New Townsville. Or something. And I'm Bubbles, the Blue Powerpuff Girl. I get to wear this really cute dress. It's the perfect shade of blue. Oh, and I protect New Townsville, too. I guess I'm Buttercup, the Green Powerpuff Girl. Did you know that the Powerpuff Girls aired in Japan? It's not uncommon for media to be aired in other countries in sub or dub form. Some shows even get adaptations specifically for their country. Please watch my girl's heroine video. Sometimes we get retellings of classic stories in anime form. Sometimes anime get turned into western style cartoons. Or sometimes we get whatever Powerpuff Girls Z is. Dimashita Powerpuff Girl Z is a magical girl anime made by Toei Animation as a 50th anniversary project for the studio. Cartoon Network was involved with the planning, and the series was produced by TV Tokyo, Aniplex, and Toei Animation. A lot of the staff worked on famous shoujo and magical girl series. Miho Shimogasa, the character designer, was an animation director for 90 Sailor Moon, and did character designs for Ultramaniac and Cutie Honey Flash. Director Iku Ishiguro, was also an animation director for Maho Shoujo Lalabelle. Writer Yoshio Urasawa worked on some of the Akko-chan anime and has also worked on some Sanrio projects. He's also been involved with less girly works like Rama One Half, Lupin the Third, and Digimon. 
Those are just a few highlights out of an incredibly accomplished staff. You can tell by looking at this show and listening to the soundtrack that it has a very different vibe from the original series. But once you watch it, you realize that there's an appreciation for the source material. Even if Craig McCracken himself wasn't actively involved with the project. For this segment, I will mostly be using footage from the English dub since it's visually higher quality, but for this review, I watched the entirety of the original Japanese. I watched the dub when I was younger and I'm already familiar with it, but I never got the chance to watch the Japanese version until now. The music alone made watching in a lower quality worth it. Just know I've seen both versions and they don't differ that much. Powerpuff Girl Z has a very different setup from the original show. Momoko, who is Blossom, Miyako, who is Bubbles, and Kaoru, who is Buttercup, are not sisters nor children of the Professor. They are normal schoolgirls, and they're what I'd imagine the original three grew up to be. Buttercup is a total tomboy who loves sports. That makes sense. Bubbles loves fashion, cute things, and has a calm demeanor, but can sometimes be a little too spacey. Again, makes sense. Blossom is the most different. But I can maybe see the original Blossom becoming this boy-obsessed, sweets-loving manga reader who hates studying. Sometimes gifted children can grow bored if they aren't challenged, and might revert back to childish tendencies. Maybe this is a phase for Blossom? Or maybe this is permanent? I'm speaking from experience as a former gifted kid. I mean, look at my channel. Blossom suffered from burnout and never recovered. But that's just a theory. A Powerpuff theory. I'm gonna miss MatPat. The girls, who I'm still going to call Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup, are not born with powers, but receive them after each puts themselves in harm's way to protect a child. The rays of light came from an accident that turns Chemical X into Chemical Z. White rays created heroes, and black rays created villains. I don't like what that implies. What I find odd is that the first episode jumps into a battle with Mojo Jojo, and then we get separate episodes of each girl being tracked down by the Professor, his son Ken, and their robot dog Peach. I think it's hilarious that Blossom gets tied down like a criminal, and Buttercup is unhappy with having to wear a skirt, but Bubbles is happy to do whatever because she loves her new look. Who is this now? Smelly human, can you tell me where? <laughs> Oh well. She's so me. Once the girls officially become a group, they spend their days ditching class, fighting bad guys, and bonding with the professor, Peach and Ken. Episode 4 is actually a great episode for establishing the girls' dynamic with the professor's actual kid. In the show, the professor does not have a wife despite having a child. So Ken is motherless. The girls do their best throughout the episode to be the mother figures Ken doesn't have which ends up annoying him. But after saving Ken from one of Mojo's schemes, the group settles for older sister roles in his life. It's honestly really sweet. Speaking of Mojo, I am so happy Powerpuff Girls decided to keep the villains from the main show, even if they've been reimagined for this version. Mojo, of course, is perfect for the show. Instead of being the professor's former assistant, he's a zoo monkey and such a goofy villain. As much as I love his redesign, I hate how the show got rid of his repetitive speech. They just make him say Mojo at the end of every sentence. But he can fly, so I guess it evens out. Every Magical Girl series needs a goofy first villain that comes back too much. And I'm so glad it's Mojo. In the first half of the series we also get the Amoeba Boys, one of which had a sex change. Congratulations. The Gang Green Gang, Princess, the Rowdy Rough Boys, who are somehow more disgusting in this version. I do not like them, even if it's funny that they call Mojo Mama. There's an entire episode of them dressing up as girls and doing very impolite and gross things. It was not fun to watch, I do not like them. But my favorite from the original lineup is probably Sedusa. Sakurako is a sweet but insecure girl who has a crush on a boy named Soichiro. However, she's struck by a black Z-Ray, and when she puts on lipstick, she turns into Sedusa, the mistress who can shapeshift into anyone. She goes on a stealing spree, the girls have to catch her in a really fun chase, and Buttercup knocks her out with her hammer. Taking her to the lab, the professor returns Sakurako back to normal, and the following day, 
She confesses her love. And he likes her back. Oh, that's so adorable. We also get some anime original villains like Duchess Morbux, who is the older sister of Princess, and Takaki, a werewolf monster who has a special connection to Bubbles. All of the girls get individual episodes exploring their struggles and connections. Blossom has a cringy episode where she falls for the class clown. And then the following episode is about her running away because she feels like the group doesn't appreciate her as the leader. Blossom ends up befriending a monster who is also trying to find his place. And the two have a wonderful moment towards the end of the story. <sighs> お前はここに残るんだ。私もいていいじゃないケチ。ここは私の居場所じゃないの。違う。ここはお前の居場所だ。ああやって、お前を気遣ってくれたり、喧嘩をしてくれる仲間がいるじゃねえか。俺には誰
This actually leads to an emotional scene where their robot dog Peach must be sacrificed as they need all the white light. No exceptions. This would have been more impactful if Peach stayed gone and the girls lost their powers once the fight was over, but that's depressing. And we get an ending where Peach is alive and the girls are stuck protecting New Townsville forever! Yay! Powerpuff Girl Z is pure fun. It feels like someone's anime fanfiction brought to life. They really said let's give the Powerpuff Girls the Sailor Moon, Pretty Cure, Ojimajo Doremi treatment and I'm here for it! If you like classic, light-hearted, magical girl anime, you will love this show. If you've only seen the original Powerpuff Girls, you might have a harder time jumping into this entry, but I think you can still enjoy it if you keep an open mind. Powerpuff Girls Z has love for the source material, but it's not trying to copy what's already been made. I appreciate that Powerpuff Girls Z is its own thing and can stand out from the original. Plus the weapons, the outfits, I'm with Bubbles. I'd be a superhero too if I could wear a cute outfit every day. Wow, you made it to the second item segment. First, peep the Bubbles cosplay. Uh, I don't really do cosplay anymore, honestly. I wasn't very good at it in the first place. But this costume does bring me a lot of happiness. I think it is super cute. I will be filming so many TikToks after filming this because I cannot let this go to waste. I never have time to cosplay anyway, so the fact that I'm in this, I need to take advantage. I need to film like 10 videos. <laughs> anyway, I just have one little piece of merchandise and that is the DS game straight from Japan. Japan exclusive and probably should have stayed there because it's a Mario Party clone and not a great one. Game Day Dimashita Powerpuff Girls Z was developed by Infinity and published by Bandai for the Nintendo DS. The game is a simple Mario Party clone that's really cute, but not very fun. In the single player campaign, you play as Blossom, Bubbles, or Buttercup, who each have unique maps. My favorite is probably Buttercups because... SPACE! So, when you play by yourself, you just compete against Mojo. As long as you make it to the end of the board before Mojo, you win, regardless of how many minigames you've won or lost. However, winning minigames lets you move ahead even more, so I don't think you could win with just good rolls alone. There are several minigames that can be triggered based on the space you or Mojo land on. All of these games are timed, so if you don't know Japanese or you're not the best at quick math, you might be screwed on a few of these. I am American, I don't know geography! But at least I know China and Singapore are two different places! No. God bless America. However, there are plenty of games that are very easy. Most of the time. For an NPC, Mojo is really OP sometimes. I've lost to him more times than I'd like to admit. Speaking of Mojo, he has his own icon as well, which is just... Mini games. Randomized mini games where you can't even play as him. Big sad. I personally would not recommend this game for the two of you who care, but I will say the pixel art is super cute. Plus that little jingle when you win a game. Oh, it makes me so happy! Inject it into my veins! Honestly, the music in general is just good, but I love that specific sound. I don't know what's in it. Crack, probably, but oh my gosh! <laughs> okay, now that I've got that crazy energy out, 
I hope you enjoyed the second item segment that consisted of one item and a cosplay. I don't know what I'm doing. I hope you're enjoying the video so far. And I do have a Bubbles figure up here that's from the 2016 series. So that and the shirt, all I've got. I didn't plan these segments out very well, but it's okay. Enjoy the rest of the video. With my blah 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 blah, shall rule the world. I will be the one in control. Total global power shall be my responsibility. I I do not repeat myself like that. I am clear, concise, and to the point. Reiterating is not my thing. I and every time Bubbles, Buttercup, and I stop you, when are you gonna learn that you're never, never, never gonna take over the world? Do you really think such a beloved series wouldn't get an anniversary special? The Powerpuff Girls Rule is a Flash animated special episode about the mayor being sent the key to the world and misplacing it. Now it's up to the girls to find the key before any of the bad guys. I don't have much to say about this one. It's neat to see the girls in yet another style. I am so glad they redid the intro. It looks so good. But why meme? Why no legs? Why Mojo Sing? The beauty of the Powerpuff Girls Rule is that it didn't need to exist. But it does, and you can tell everyone involved was happy to reunite. Mojo literally makes the world a better place, finds it boring, and then becomes evil again and gets the crap kicked out of him by her favorite girls. No complaints. Just fun. Remember, your playing of Dance God's Revolution tears up the Team Powerpuff. Oh no, my sisters are tiny and dead. We're not dead. We're a manifestation of your subconscious trying to stop you from doing something stupid. Oh. So don't play Dance Pants Revolution. Okay. But I never said I wouldn't play Dance Pants Revolution too. Skipping a few years, Cartoon Network celebrated the Powerpuff Girls 15th anniversary with another special called Dance Pants that featured Ringo Starr. We've come full circle with the Beatles references. What's tragic is that the song he made for the special wasn't actually used in the episode. The song was still being used for promotional material, and it's not great to begin with. So, not a total loss. I'm sure you've noticed that the art style is very different from the original series. Craig McCracken did not participate in the special, but it still feels like an original Powerpuff story. Mojo Jojo makes a dance game that turns the girls into dancing robots. Insert dance battle that allows the artist to make fun visuals. Mojo also kidnaps some important people, I guess. One of which is Ringo Starr's character. The story is just there to be there. The real treat is the visuals and the return of the original cast. It's not a masterpiece, but it's fun. And I'm glad Dance Pants exists. The internet was wrong to hate this special. Even if I do find it odd that Bubbles has light blonde hair. That's the only thing that threw me off. And Bubbles having ice breath. That's Blossom's power. We had a whole episode about this. Okay, rock, paper, scissors. Go! One, two, three! Scissors? Man, I always thought this game. Now we've made it to the most hated part of the Powerpuff Legacy. The 2016 reboot. The series was detested before it even made it to air, as it was presumed to be a shady cash grab that was at best not planned very well or at worst, spit on the legacy of the original by not involving the original creator, recasting Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup but keeping a lot of the same voice actors from the original, cutting out fan favorite character Miss Bellum, having outdated memes, and coming out with toys before the show even premiered. This show was doomed from the start, and it didn't help that the majority of the worst and most controversial episodes were in the first season, when people were watching the show. By the time the show had some genuinely great episodes, no one cared. But I do. I made it my mission to find good in what appears to be a soulless cash grab. But I'll need to acknowledge the bad too. So I'll organize it like this. First episode, bad or controversial episodes that are worth mentioning, good episodes that are worth mentioning, and the final episode. I did watch the entire series, but I'm not going to sit here and ramble about every little thing. That's redundant. Okay? Great! The first episode is called Escape from Monster Island. Bubbles wins two concert tickets, 
and her sisters fight over who gets to go throughout a rescue mission. First, who gave these elementary school students smartphones? Professor, Professor that's, that's terrible, terrible parenting. parenting. Second, the girls are characterized as being older, but look almost the same as they did in the original show. It's jarring. I honestly wish they were closer to the anime ages. I know Cartoon Network kept the girls this way for marketability, but within the show it doesn't make sense, especially when you put them beside their peers. Tangent aside, I like this episode and its ending, where Bubbles doesn't pick either of her sisters because of their constant arguing. Predictable? Yes. Fun? Yes. Also, surprise, I like the new voices. They're not as standout as the originals, but they're cute and I hope the actresses got more work after this. I can't imagine the threats they got over being in the show. I already told you guys that the show wrote out Miss Bellum because Miss Bellum wasn't quite indicative of the kind of messaging we wanted to be giving out at this time. So we sort of had her move on. You mean having strong, intelligent female characters who also happen to be beautiful doesn't go with your show starring strong and adorable female leads targeted towards little girls who will grow up to be women who could resemble Miss Bellum? You want to think about that? Moving on before I strangle somebody. I need to briefly mention the episode Painbow as well. It's, it's the, the episode, episode with the twerking. twerking. If you were actively online when the show was airing, you know what I'm talking about. Basically, in the episode, everyone in Townsville is hypnotized by a rainbow that makes them only want to have fun and avoid responsibility. Except for the Powerpuff Girls. They follow the rainbow to investigate, and it leads them to a cloud rave with a drugged up panda who wants to party and hug. Wanna hug? OMG! Yas! Bubbles do not go near that girl man. Insert yas! An inappropriate movement. Can we move on please? Thank you. Now we're getting to the fun ones. Horn Sweet Horn is notable because it was found offensive by some members of the transgender community. Since I'm not trans, I decided to ask some of my trans viewers if they thought the episode was offensive, and I got mixed replies. Some said no, that the episode was cute. Some just thought the writing was bad, but not necessarily offensive, and some said yes, and that the episode made them uncomfortable. All of these opinions are valid. Gender and expression is a very personal thing, and I have no authority to tell you how you should feel about anything related to LGBTQ representation. I'm going to tell you all what happens in this episode, and let you decide for yourselves whether it's offensive, not offensive, or just a crappily written episode. Bubbles loves unicorns, and wants to see one on our school's zoo trip, but is laughed at by her peers because unicorns don't exist. As she mopes, Bubbles meets Donnie, a real unicorn. Well, he wants to be. As of right now, he's a horse with a horn taped to his head. Bubbles gets the idea to take Donnie to the professor, and give him a procedure that'll make him a real unicorn. Donnie agrees. The professor warns him of the dangers such a procedure could have. Donnie doesn't listen because he trusts Bubbles, and he turns into... a monster! Bubbles does eventually calm Donnie down, and helps him realize that he's always been a unicorn, even if his outside doesn't match. But then it's revealed he is actually a unicorn, and he runs off with his unicorn mother and her friends. What? Again, you decide. I have no authority on this one. Next controversial topic I need to discuss is not necessarily one episode, but one character. Jared Shapiro. I don't care if his design is based on one of the writers. I have a hard time believing a grown man has a crush on a circle with stubs. But if that's true, that's insanely cringe. What I do have a problem with is the fact that their designs don't match. I don't like their dynamic to begin with, but look at these two side by side. That's not gonna work. These little girls don't need to be in relationships anyway. Blossom, you can do better than whatever's going on here. Don't get possessive over this little guy who'd get knocked over if you breathe too hard in his direction. It's already a red flag that his last name is Shapiro. The looks, the voice, the age, and the awkward dynamic is not helping. I don't care what theater reference this show throws at me. I'm not buying what you're selling. It feels like somebody WANTS TO SELL ME SOMETHING! <laughs> I told you he was on to us! Never, Never make, make me, me discuss, discuss this, this again. again. The last controversy, and debatably the biggest, comes in the form of a special in Season 2 called Power of Four, which is five parts, so... Womp womp. 
Bubbles has a new friend named Bliss, who the other girls think is imaginary. It's not until there's an attack in the movie theater that Bliss finally reveals herself and gets KO'd by the professor. In the following episode, the professor's entire character gets butchered. Ten years ago, I was locked in a bitter rivalry with Professor Neutronium. She had just completed her work on creating the perfect little boy. He could fly and stuff. So I set out to create the perfect little girl who could fly further and stuff. But I accidentally added an extra ingredient to the concoction. Chemical W. Thus the perfect little girl was born. Wait a minute. You spilled Chemical X when you made us. You made the same mistake twice? Uh, 22 times, actually. I also had some difficulty with chemicals A through V. That's not my Utonium. Bliss tells her side of the story as well, and they definitely miss each other. But then Mojo pops in and says he also knew Bliss. He wants her to go to the dark side. We get a dramatic scene where she disappears, only for her to stay. Okay. Side note, the villains aren't as memorable in the show. My favorite episodes don't really focus on them, and when they do, it feels like a smaller scale adventure compared to what the original RZ did. I don't love that change. Part 3 is just the girls dealing with a forgettable villain while Bliss continues to struggle with her powers. Part 4 is where we get a huge reveal that Bliss's pet elephant is actually the dreaded him, who wants her powers for his own selfish desires. They merge, chaos ensues, and the girls must save their sister teaming up at the end in an epic battle to defeat their greatest foe. Starting with the good, I appreciate the attempt at making a television movie event with this story. A new Powerpuff who came before the girls we know is an interesting idea, and I always love hearing Olivia Olsen. The ending fight is great as well. That being said, this did not need to exist. I hate Bliss's design. The blue hair, big hip, no chest combination? Ugh. She looks so out of place next to the other girls. And the professor going through almost the entire alphabet with his creations? That makes Utonium go from a well-meaning father to an irresponsible maniac. You're telling me this man went through chemicals A through X to create little girls because some female lookalike created a little boy? I think I'm more mad about the professor than Bliss. Bliss just feels like someone's OC that was somehow made official. She's not a horrible character but it's giving self-insert fanfiction where the character has a tragic backstory, yet is loved by all regardless. I can see why the writers made her leave. Okay, in between my last recording session and this one, I was terribly sick. So sorry if my voice sounds crusty for the rest of this video. But I'm done being negative! I want to find the positives. I've picked out my four favorite episodes, one from each season and an extra for good measure. First, Road Trippin' is a simple story about Bubbles and the Professor going to an event hosted by her favorite artist. Bubbles plans this trip because she thinks the Professor loves her the least. I think this is a unique take for the series, because I always got the feeling the Professor favored Bubbles, or was at least more gentle with her out of the three. The entire time, the Professor stays glued to his iPad like a Gen Alpha kid with millennial parents, but it's not because he isn't paying attention to her. It's because he's researching the artist she loves so much, so he can connect with Bubbles. The two even save the day together after clearing up the misunderstanding. Second, Tooth or Consequences is an extremely dramatic cautionary tale of what happens if you don't go to the dentist. Blossom has a cavity and is afraid of big drills, so she lies to get out of her appointment. Her cavity gets worse, and when she tries a natural remedy, she turns into a monster. What are those? Are those fingers? That line made me love this episode. Blossom is hunted down by the town, she's cornered by her family, and she finally agrees to see the dentist. Okay, Professor. I'll go. Ah! Oh! My! Ow! Ow! Said I'd give you another toothache if you didn't go! I said I was gonna go! Ah, oh, my bad. Buttercup is absolutely slaying in this. Of course, Blossom realizes that the dentist isn't that bad, and they all enjoy some ice cream. Not only is this episode hilarious, but it teaches a great moral. Going to the dentist can be scary depending on what you're getting done, and don't even get me started on the orthodontist. I've been through two sets of braces and have to wear a retainer for the rest of my life. 
Not fun! But good dental hygiene is crucial to your overall health. Third, The Oct Father is an amazing godfather turned psychological thriller story where Princess has a monopoly on the plushy market and uses her stealing skills to manipulate her peers. She attempts to take advantage of Bubbles by stealing Octi, so she'll bring the Leaning Tower of Pisa to school for a project. Huh? huh? It takes some effort, but Princess gets Octi. She tries every way to threaten Bubbles, which is a huge mistake. Bubbles is out for blood and is determined to make Princess's life hell until she not only returns Octi, but everyone else's plush friends. It is so funny! And the episode ends with Bubble saying this. Just so we're clear, from now on, if you ever, ever, ever try to play with Octi again, just ask! <laughs> I'm terrified of her. Lastly, I need to talk about my favorite episode, Bubbles the Blue. Bubbles is feeling down, but she doesn't know why. Her sisters try everything to cheer her up, but nothing works. Alarmed that their normally bubbly Bubbles isn't herself, Blossom starts to blame herself, and Buttercup starts to blame everyone else. It's when she's finally left alone that Bubbles can hear the cries of the monster the other girls have been fighting throughout the episode. She talks to him, calms him down, and says it's okay that he's angry and sad. The episode ends with the four watching the sunset, as Blossom pushes Buttercup off the pier. I'm bored. What are we looking at? <laughs> Iconic. I think this episode is a great demonstration to kids that they don't need to feel happy all the time. Even the people in our lives who shine the brightest have dark days. And sometimes it's not anyone's fault. Feelings, all of them, are part of the human experience. In every version of the Powerpuff Girls, we are taught that there is no good without the bad. There are no heroes without villains. There is no happiness without sadness. The Powerpuff Girls 2016 did not need to exist, and its very existence spits in the face of the original's legacy. It was initially made out of pure greed, but that doesn't mean there isn't heart in this production. Somewhere. A show is more than a creator, actors, and corporations. There are directors, writers, artists, musicians, who bring these stories to life and want to make the best of what opportunity they've been given. When I watched Bubbles the Blue or Octfather, I saw real passion, humor, and heart. It's present in the show, albeit hard to find through a sea of lowbrow humor and Family Guy-style cutaways. The series ends with the episode Sideline Dad. The girls are playing soccer, but the professor is not interested. Once he realizes that he needs to step up and take an interest in the sport to connect with his kids, he goes overboard, telling off the coach and becoming their new one. He does realize the error of his ways by the end, and the Powerpuff Girls save the day. This was a decent episode, but it doesn't feel like a finale, meaning the show was quietly cancelled after three seasons. If you want to give the show a chance, watch Bubbles the Blue first. Do not start with season one as it is rough. If you want to keep hating the show, you have reasons to and I can't stop you. This show was not initially made with good intentions, and I can't blame anyone for not wanting to look past that. I wouldn't have if I wasn't making this video. But before I move on from the reboot, we have a crossover with one of Cartoon Network's biggest shows, Teen Titans Go! A brief history for those who don't know, the Teen Titans is a DC-owned superhero group consisting of Robin, who you know from Batman, Cyborg, Beast Boy, Raven, and my favorite, Starfire! They're a teenage team fighting evil and dealing with the struggles of growing up. In the 2000s, Cartoon Network aired a Teen Titans cartoon with a killer theme song and anime flair. It was funny, it was action-packed, it had heart, and it ended on a cliffhanger. For years, fans begged for a new season, but what did they get? A goofy cartoon with butts and waffles. My best friend's son loves the show, so I know more about it than I ever intended, but I don't hate it. Guys, look! A birdie! <gasps> it's pretty! Let's catch it! But isn't it funny that these two hated reboots got a crossover episode? TTG vs PPG has Mojo Jojo and the girls teleported to the world of Teen Titans Go! Beast Boy and Cyborg go with Mojo to create a monkey army because... Monkeys. <laughs> the remaining Titans are with the Powerpuff Girls, and keep referring to them as babies despite the girls showing more maturity than they ever could. Side note, Tara Strong voices Raven and was the original Bubbles, 
Do you think this was awkward for her? So while Mojo, Beast Boy, and Cyborg are gathering their monkey army, the girls, Starfire, Robin, and Raven, are having competitions to see who the better heroes are. And when the girls prove to be better than they say... It wasn't a competition. How very immature. What do you expect? They're babies. It, it was, was literally, literally your idea, idea Titans. Titans. The episode ends with Mojo not getting the army he wanted, the girls kicking Mojo's butt, and the narrator saying... And so once again, the day is saved. No thanks to the Teen Titans. Seriously, what is wrong with those guys? I love the way this episode uses the narrator. Robin's the only one who can hear him, and the other characters are just like, oh no. Robin's hearing voices again. <laughs> like this is just normal. Is this normal for him? Why is no one helping this poor guy? As of me making this video, there is no more Powerpuff content for me to cover. However, there was an attempt to make a live-action Powerpuff series for the CW. If you've seen Riverdale, you know the vibes. This cancelled project has a full script leaked online. And it is awful. The professor is a guy named Drake, who is the opposite of the professor we know. He's greedy, manipulative, and anything but a loving father. Mojo, who is human with a son named Jojo, was Drake's former lab partner who got zero credit for the discovery of Chemical X. And the girls? Oh my god. Buttercup is a serial cheater, having multiple girlfriends. Bubbles is a party girl. Blossom is high strung. And the professor treats them like products, telling them to stick to the character bible. Oh, and he has a relationship with Miss Bellum. During a fight, Blossom accidentally kills Mojo, and the girls are no longer allowed to fight which might be for the best. Skipping ahead to their adulthood, Buttercup is a small town firefighter who has ice breath. Did no one fact check this? Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. Bubbles is a failed reality TV star, recovering addict, and in sales. If they tried this again, you know she'd have a podcast. Bubbles Declassified Superhero Survival Guide. Those guys are assholes. Blossom drowns herself in college studies, collecting degrees like Pokemon cards to escape her harsh reality. How does she afford that? Now, with the girls turning 25, they can collect their trust fund, but it has to be in person. The girls reunite for the first time in years, and it's filled with inappropriate, mean-spirited, and downright cringe dialogue. The line moveon.org will live in my head forever. I'm so glad this was not made. I hated every second of reading this trash. Luckily, this still is not the end of the Powerpuff Girls. We've gotten so many collaborations, the most notable being with New Jeans, but we're also getting a new Powerpuff show with Craig McCracken and hopefully most of the original cast. There isn't much about the show out yet, but it is confirmed to be happening and will be made at Hanna-Barbera Studios Europe. I can't wait to make a video about this when it releases. And that is my deep dive into everything Powerpuff Girls. I hope you all enjoyed this. I think every entry has value, but the original and Z are my favorites. I loved having an excuse to revisit them. Make sure to subscribe and follow me on TikTok and Instagram. I make lots of cute content. Lastly, troop on hopelets, stay adorkable. Bye!